Madness and hate erupt anew in Dallas as President Kennedy's accused assassin is shot down himself during a jail transfer. There's an ominous symbol in Lee Harvey Oswald's murder weapon as he is taken to the city jail basement where an armored car is to move him to a maximum security cell. Oswald walks his last mile. His assailant moves in from the right. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. Now, from another camera, the motion is slowed. The murderer moves in, and here is the shame of all America as Jack Rubenstein takes the law unto himself. The dying Oswald is rushed to the same hospital where President Kennedy died. Doctors work to save his life. But 48 hours and seven minutes after the president's death, his accused slayer is dead. The sound of the muffled drum sweeps in melancholy waves over the hushed throng, a hush broken only by a stifled sob, a murmured prayer. A whole people is lifted up in common sorrow and ennobled in their hearts. Down this avenue of sadness, they bring President John F. Kennedy, martyred hero, to lie in state under the great dome of the Capitol. Mrs. Kennedy begins the long hours of her public grief with the courageous dignity that has marked each moment of her ordeal. Caroline and John seem to mirror their mother's poise. With President Johnson and Robert Kennedy, she is in the van of the mourners who will pay their respects in the historic rotunda of the Capitol. President Johnson represents a sorrowing people as he places a wreath marked from President Johnson and the nation. Mrs. Kennedy comes forward with Caroline in a tableau that calls for no words. Its poignancy calls only for tears. Bearing the burden of their own sorrow, a quarter of a million people brave near freezing weather to pass by the dead president in tribute. Some waited for as long as 12 hours in a line that at times stretched for 10 miles. The old, the young, the aged, the children. They became one in their grief, in the spontaneous outpouring that throws up an enduring memorial to the American spirit. And so they kept their vigil through the long and lonely night, each man a tiny island of sadness buffeted by the seas of unhappy fate. The next day, the body is borne to St. Matthew's Cathedral with Mrs. Kennedy and the president's family walking in humble prayer behind the caisson. Not since the funeral of Britain's King Edward VII in 1910 has there been such a gathering of kings and queens, presidents and premiers. 220 dignitaries from 92 foreign lands honor the warrior who died while fighting for peace and liberty and the dignity of man. Erect and proud, Mrs. Kennedy walks the six long blocks with firm step yet tearful eye. At the cathedral, a pontifical funeral mass is to be said for the repose of the soul of the first Roman Catholic president, a devout man from a devout family who today find deep solace in the solemn rites of their church. As the distinguished mourners gather in St. Matthew's, peoples of all faiths around the world join them in prayers. Mass is read in Moscow. Buddhists pray in South Vietnam. Shinto priests conduct services in Tokyo. A rabbi exhorts God in Israel. The foreign dignitaries move unobtrusively to their pews. They attach little importance to their own identities today. Joining the humble in the four corners of the earth, they pray, each in his own way, that the soaring spirit that was President Kennedy in life may find eternal rest in death. The strains of the Ave Maria reach out like a caress. 
Mrs. Kennedy requested it. The Ave Maria was sung at her wedding. After the sacrifice of the Mass, there are prayers aloud in the tongues of all faiths. Then will come the solemn moment when the incense is tossed on hot coals and Cardinal Cushing, an old family friend, blesses the mortal remains of John F. Kennedy. From St. Matthew's, the cortege is to cross the Potomac to the Cemetery of Heroes, Arlington. As the casket is returned to the caisson, there comes a family vignette that must take its place with those memories we hold warm and dear. A gentle reminder from his mother, and John John celebrates his third birthday with a soldier's farewell to his father. No finer epitaph could be extended President Kennedy than his own words from the speech he was to deliver in Dallas the day of his assassination. We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve for our time and for all time that ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. The world will remember those words of President Kennedy and his inaugural plea, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The Irish Honor Guard with a flourish of arms and the precious banner that was the President's shroud for three days is folded smartly for presentation to Mrs. Kennedy. An eternal flame is lighted before the grave by Mrs. Kennedy the first such memorial to burn in Arlington Cemetery. She is followed by the President's brothers, Robert and Edward. Thus the American people have buried their beloved leader. May his family find comfort in knowing they walked with greatness. And may the soul of John Fitzgerald Kennedy rest in peace.